Live from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Veeam on 2019. Brought to you by Veeam. Welcome back to Miami, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante. We're here at the Fontainebleau Hotel, Veeam on day one of two day coverage uh, of, the, of the Veeam conference, very swanky hotel. Dave Russell is here, he's the Vice President of Enterprise Strategy at Veeam. David, good to see you again. Thanks good so much for you. coming on theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for having me again. You're very welcome. So, uh, let's see, you're well over, let's see, a year out. There's just about a year out of Gartner, yeah, right? Yeah. And so, okay, so you've been injected with the Kool-Aid fully, I presume, there right? Clean and, and uh, green, yes. And, uh, but we're still going to talk a little bit about you know, the, the magic quadrant, but before we get into that, um, Talk about your first year here. Yeah. Uh, your impressions, did they meet, exceed your expectations? It exceeded my expectations, but I can honestly say I'm not doing what I thought I was going to be doing here, but it actually turned out to be better. The other thing I would honestly tell you is by I'm on Pacific Coast time at the moment. Arizona, we, we're too like unsophisticated for daylight savings, right? So I'm either mountain or Pacific, but I'm Pacific now. But by 10 a.m. my time, I pretty much, what I thought I was going to do that day is out the window and I'm doing something else. And it's fun though, I mean, you know, now especially with the investment that we had earlier in the year and the cash reserves we ended last year with, looking at a lot of partnership capabilities, looking at ecosystem activity, certainly involved with customer activity, we're redoing our marketing and how we're focusing our go-to-market. So it's a whole variety of things that sort of change hourly. So on the, when you talk about the M&A side, I mean, you're, you're, you've always been a dot connector and you're, Right, because you, you talk to all the vendors, you talk to all the customers, and you could see the picture. You have a huge observation space. So part of your job uh, uh, on strategy is to try to what? Figure out where the gaps are, yeah. and then drive strategy around do we build, do we buy? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it really does net down to what you said. It's a build-buy decision. It's an acceleration to market kind of a decision. And then the hard part is, what are you willing to trade off? You know, and of course the real answer is as little as humanly possible. But you have to decide, just because you can do it, just because you have the money, doesn't necessarily mean you should pull the trigger. So if anything, it's curious because people like myself and a couple of my colleagues, we almost are more discerning. So we look at, okay, the technology, is it really viable? Do, do our due diligence, right? But then we also look at, well, does this fit culturally? Is the integration point really there? Is the customer value really going to be significantly improved? And if you can really not answer that very favorably, then keep the money. So you worked at IBM for a number of years, you worked at Gartner for a number of years, now you're back working for a vendor. Yeah. Compare and contrast those, those roles. I mean, Gartner, you do a lot of writing, you do a lot of traveling, you talk to a zillion people. I'm sure you talk to a lot of people here too, but you're coming at it from a very uh, biased perspective. Whereas Gartner, of course, you're unbiased. You're, you're serving the end customer. So, Talk about the difference in those two roles. So I approach it a little uniquely in that I am biased. I mean, I'm paid by a vendor, <laughs> right? So you know, there's a certain inherent bias in there. But I go into a customer conversation and say, you know, maybe you shouldn't be using Veeam for certain things. So I'll give you an example. You know, we have Unix capabilities with Solaris and AIX. There are other vendors that do that even better than we do. They have rich application integration. If someone says, that's my number one problem, honestly, we're not your best choice. Now, the reality is, most of the world's moving towards more physical and virtual Windows and Linux. So I'll come into, a, say, a large enterprise, and I'll say, okay, if you're like most shops, and I always under, undersell it, right? probably 85% of your workload is physical, virtual, Windows, Linux. And they always interrupt me, go, no, no, it's 92%. Like, okay, yeah. well we can help with that 92%. Yeah. The other 7%, I'm honestly going to tell you, we're not best of breed. Yeah, that's a safe, balanced view, that the AIX Solaris piece, that's all right. Five series, that's you know, there's certain things, you know, yeah. we, we want to stick to our swim lane. We think it's a pretty wide lane, but there's no reason to come out of it. So your role is strategy. Talk a little bit about how you're, you're turning that strategy into, into action and specifics at Veeam. Yeah, a big part of it has to do with cloud. I know that's the word that we've been talking about for a long, long time. So there's the aspirational aspect of cloud and the operational. The aspirational is, I want to be able to move in and out, I want mobility, I want the ability to exit. The operational is, I want to be able to do this efficiently. Meaning, I want to be able to either send data to the cloud, my on-prem backup, or I want to be able to protect SaaS-based workloads or infrastructure as a service workloads, so cloud-native workloads, 
And then over time, I might want to be able to leverage that for something other than availability. So how can you rapidly make the data and only the portion of data that I need available to me when I need it? I was taking some, some notes during the keynotes and I, and I was just doing like a little, not really a tag cloud, but I was trying to identify as I heard them and grab them the attributes of, of cloud data protection. And I'm going to throw some out to you. You okay. tell me, we'll play a kind of word association, I guess. So I had you know, fast recovery, uh, API based, open, simple, transparent, data oriented, automated, cloud pricing, federated to accommodate the edge. Are these some of the attributes that we should associate with, with cloud data protection? Maybe some of the things that I'm, that I'm missing. How do you look at the attributes of a company and its products providing cloud data protection? Yeah, so a big part of it, I actually like the phrase hybrid cloud, even better than you know, people say multi-cloud. The reason I like that is because hybrid presumes that you could have on-premises as well. So like if it was the Dave and Dave company tomorrow, we'd probably be born in the cloud, right? Everything would be software as a service, we'd you know, get some public cloud space. Now if we've been in business for 20 years, we've got investments that we've made and we don't want to you know, get rid of that any sooner than we have to. So hybrid cloud I like, but I think you nailed it in that what, is this, what do every one of those attributes have in common? It's trying to get your most precious resource to you in a way that you want to consume it with the least amount of friction as possible. We want to re reduce the aggravation associated with being able to access that rapidly. When you, when you think about the customer conversations that you've had at, at Veeam and even go back to your Gartner days, I've always felt like this notion of, of not hybrid, I, I see hybrid and, and multi-cloud as different. I've always looked at multi-cloud as multi-vendor. Yeah. yeah, I've got you know, line of business, I got shadow IT, I got different IT projects, and I got multiple clouds. And it was, it's, to me it was always less of a strategy than sort of this is where we are, and now people need to put together a hybrid strategy. It's like IT's been asked to come clean up this mess as, as it always is. What's your take on, on the, the, the hybrid landscape and how we got here, but sp more specifically, customer strategies when you consult with your, your customers? Yeah, I, it, you're right that there's a lot of departmental buying, and there's a lot of, some cases, it's best to breed, so I'm very willing to go and look at multiple providers, because you know, I didn't sign up to go deploy the third best solution. You know, everyone wants to, what they think will be the most appropriate tool for them, and rightfully so. So I think that's how we got, to your point, we didn't have a strategy that said I want 10 vendors. We arrived at an implementation choice that resulted in 10 vendors being deployed. And then to your point further, then we had to layer on something on top of that. That's really where we come in. And you know, simple as it sounds, we're, we really want to promote choice. Choice of infrastructure, choice of cloud, choice of hypervisor, choice of operating system. So great discussion vector is the best of breed versus sort of integration. Yes. Um, and my question is, you know, because that's been a, decades long yeah. sort of trade off that people have made. You see it in the software business, the hardware business, and all through the industry. Is the API economy changing that? Can you be both, I mean Veeam, let's, let's agree, Veeam is a best of breed provider, um, and your, well, your portfolio is growing, you're a billion dollar company. You take a company like a, a, a Dell who's got this ridiculously large portfolio, they can come into a customer and say, well, even with services or an IBM, we can wrap the big blue blanket around you and integrate you know, e everything. With the API economy, does that, does that change the game on that argument of best of breed versus integration and convenience? It's a nuanced answer. The answer is a little yes and a little no. Kind of it I, depends, right? And, and yeah. let me decompose that, because that's a cop out. But, but the, the it depends aspect is really, APIs are wonderful to create an ecosystem and other integration points. If that's about offering your expanded ability to do something, that's a positive. If that really means that, well, because I can't deliver what you need, you've got to go and write it yourself, that is a negative. So if the API is leveraging something for even greater value, but beyond what the tool was originally designed to do, I think that's net positive. If you have to exploit the API just to get the product to work, you know, what, why did I buy your product when I have to go hire someone to write code to work your product? <laughs> you know, that's a, you know, no one got in that business. Okay, so the last Gartner Magic Quadrant that came out was the one that you sort of spearheaded back in 2017. It was like this perfect storm of, of backup uh, uh, analysts leaving Gartner, and so there's been a little bit of delay in terms of the new one coming out, which is coming out shortly, as I understand it. But one of the observations that you can make if you look at the 2016 to 2017 Gartner Magic Quadrant is that Veeam moved from lower right to, uh, to upper right, which is rare. 
Yeah. Uh, can you explain that a little bit? You were saying that it, 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 it usually goes in a different pattern. Yeah. Elucidate, please. Yeah, so the magic in the magic quadrant is if you could actually jump from one quadrant to straight to leaders, and that would be a very atypical progression. Usually, it's a backward Z, you come into the lower left, probably get over to the lower right, fall back, but go up to the upper left, and then maybe you get to leaders in the, in the upper right. The magic part and the beam, the thing that they were able to do is go from visionary lower right to leader upper right. Okay, and why do you think they were able to do that? I mean, there are numerous attributes, uh, but I, presumably 350,000, I think, is the number of customers helped, and so you got a lot of references and, and proof points, is you know, the technology it, itself, but it's rare. Why do you think Veeam has been able to succeed in that regard? I think because Veeam's been good about getting answers to the most pressing problems. You know, again, Veeam doesn't do everything, it doesn't support every single operating system, but the vast majority of the concentration of where customer issues are and customer environments are getting deployed at, we can address very well. And actually this weekend, I got here Friday night, so all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and yesterday till 5 p.m. I took our SE training. And so I deployed Veeam, worked with Active Directory, all kinds of things for 72 hours basically. And it was really that easy to use. In fact, my most difficult thing is I stayed in class till 6.30 at night because I'd never done Active Directory. I've never been Exchange Admin before, so I had to kind of come up to speed on those tools a little bit. But once I got that, it was, the product was incredibly powerful, but also very intuitive. So, you still have a little bit of that independent analyst DNA in you, so I'm going to ask you to yeah. try to put that independent hat on. When you think about you know, Veeam's uh, traditional base of, of SMB, very, very successful there, obviously super glued itself to the virtualization trend, the last couple of years, you know, Veeam was trying to move up market, uh, develop some relationships with some large players, and has had some success there. Um, is the product well suited for that larger enterprise? Um, and, and, and where do you see that going in terms of the up market progression? Yeah, so in theory, that's what I'm here to drive. You know, the enterprise you know, word is in my title, but in reality, I you know, focus more broadly than that. But if I just think about enterprise, I ran the numbers last week, and company inception to date, we've actually derived over $2 billion of software-only revenue from the enterprise market. And that's been accelerating. Now, in 2017, 18, in the first quarter of this year, almost $1 billion. So we're, we're moving, and we're moving fast. We were, had our sales kick off like most companies do, right? In January, go to sales kick off, and Ratmer says, hey, don't chase just the big deals, the $2 million deals. We've never sold a $2 million deal without having a $200,000 deal first. The very next week, we got a $2 million deal on the first paper. <laughs> so he shot low, he should have said five million. But the, the interesting thing about Veeam, and to answer your question, I think we, we resonate with the kind of challenges a large enterprise has. And we allow them to move at their own scale. If they want to move in a very large fashion, they can with Veeam. I would honestly tell them, move as it's, you know, is appropriate for you as assets age, as you're willing to take on the change in an environment, do so. But I think, you know, Veeam is interesting. It's the same piece of software that I installed on my laptop this weekend that can also go to a Fortune 100 company. The same piece of software that manages 50,000 agents. We have one shop, 50,000 Windows agents. We can do that with the same code base. And the only thing that's different is we just horizontally scale out how we deploy the capacity and then how we deploy the mover agents. I tweeted out this morning, so Ratmer was standing in front of a chart with all these features and yeah. you know, over, the, over, the, over the time, and that's been part of the hallmark of Veeam, is, is not checkbox features, but real substantive features, and you've had a you know, consistent progression. Even, even Ratmer said, this, you know, we don't have a big long-term roadmap that we you know, share with our customers, even internally. Yeah, we have a direction and a vision, but very focused almost like sort of an agile development methodology, but, yeah. but, but the point is that, and you see some companies are really good at this, some companies are not so good at this, but just consistently delivering features that are in demand, that customers want, listening to their customers, and just nailing it. And that seems to be the hallmark of, of Veeam, and as I say, some companies just don't have that in their, in their DNA. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what it really comes down to is at the end of the day, every developer thinks like a customer, and they do that because they spend a lot of time on our Veeam forums. Now, I'll be honest, when I was a mainframe backup developer, I didn't talk to that many customers. I was just writing code. 
and I didn't know how people were actually putting the product to use in production. I didn't always know what feature might be most helpful for them. You were guessing. I was trying to think of the art of the possible, <laughs> yeah. hopefully an educated guess, but yeah, I was right. really just trying to th say what might be good, what might be of you know, resonance, versus actually having someone goes on the form and says, Veeam, what I'd like you to do is X. That's one of the reasons why we do have, to your point, we don't have a 10 year roadmap where we say this feature is coming in 12 months, this feature is coming in 24 months. It's fluid, and in some cases we actually moved up delivering our eight physical agent management by a year because we started selling more and more of those and people said, I, I need that func feature functionality faster and we're willing to trade off some other feature functionality. So if we can be, as long as we can continue to respond to the market, I think we're well positioned. How does a, how does a capability like that surface itself, well obviously we're talking to customers, but how does it get into the, the, the development pipeline uh, so quickly? Yeah, well in some cases we've got a huge amount of, not just, it, it's the R part of R&D. It's the research, it's the experimentation, it's the incubation of new things. So you know, when we find that sweet intersection point, then we can quickly operationalize that. In other cases, we just have to be nimble, we have to react fast. Is it, is it a command and control culture though, where somebody says, okay, this is what we're doing, or is it more, sort of the team gets together and says, oh, this really makes sense based on what the customers are telling us, let's go. And how does that decision get made? Yeah, well ultimately it is a command and control in the sense that you know, our co-founder, one of our co-founders runs sales and marketing, our other co-founder runs R&D, and you know, they ultimately get sign off on their respective areas. But it is collaborative in the sense of we do bring forward, you know, here's what we're seeing in market, here's what we see in our customer forums, here's what our ecosystem of partners are telling us, here's our view of the top five things we ought to go do. I was struck by the other uh, uh, slide that Ratmir had, it was the $15 billion uh, slide. Um, and it was to probably uh, back up and recover, it was maybe, I don't know, seven out of the 15, if I, if I remember. But there were all these other segments, it was sort of analytics and disaster recovery and, yeah. and, and data management, all, all new pockets of, of opportunity. $15 billion today obviously growing, with, mm -hmm. especially with the cloud. How do you see that landscape and how does that affect the way you look at strategy. Yeah, so I actually put that bubble chart together. Oh, I like and it. The, the rationale between like the bubbles, you know, core we put back up in the middle because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. But also that's how we ingest data. And now we can do other things around it. So the reason for those bubbles, and they were of varying sizes, and the bubbles were sort of in and out of, to varying degrees, the main backup bubble according to how much intersection we thought as a company we can have with that where we thought we could add value, where we thought there was an ecosystem potential. So for example, analytics. We're not going to become the next best analytics company tomorrow, not even years from now. We could partner and we can provide data and we get better access to data to be able to do that, so we want to facilitate that. In other cases, maybe we really do want to go own and acquire. Well, and so to your earlier conversation, I didn't use the term, the phrase land and expand, but that's clearly what you guys are doing, yeah. starting with the $200,000 sale, growing it to $2 million sale. So those bubbles are potentially cohort sales that yes. you can sell sort of like bananas in bunches, I like to say. Right? Yeah, and part of that is you know, who do you sell to? So if you're able to go and address some of those ancillary bubbles or markets, now you've got a different entree point into the organization. If you're already involved in the organization, now you can offer more value because you can get more out of your data that you've already protected. So it, it opens up new conversations for us to have, it opens up entirely new buying centers for us too. Well how is the, the role of whom you sell to changing? I mean it was a backup admin historically, right? Yeah. Or maybe a VMware admin, VM admin. How is that changing? So greatest example I would tell you are, are events. So we acquired a company last January, or year ago January, called N2W Software. So they're predominantly at Amazon re-event conferences. You go to Amazon reInvent and no one's heard of Veeam, and if anyone's heard of either of the two companies, it's definitely N2WS and someone's seen it in the marketplace. That demographic tends to be totally different than the demographic if you go to the on-premises data center type of conference where they have heard of Veeam, and it's a very you know, different sort of mindset. To your point, you know, they grew up in a very different landscape. You know, now, instead of someone that was well steeped in server storage and networking and maybe majored in one, possibly two of those things, now you've got a generalist where he or she's probably in their 20s, has a very different view of what it should take to get something working, and has a very different view of how they want to be sold to, how you can go and reach them. So the cloud show, there might be a, a development persona yes. that you're, you're selling to, and obviously, you know, VMware, VMworld, we know what you know, that yeah. is. It's, 
It's, it's IT guys, right, is, is, the, is the predominant. Um, and, and how do you see cloud changing that? Is it cloud architects or sort of you know, cloud leaders, uh, CTOs increasingly? You know, data protection become more and more important to digital business, so how are you seeing that role change because, uh, due to cloud? So it, right now, we have to basically have more touch points. Mm -hmm. you know, our typical you know, legacy fan of our customer, our, you know, our customer base, our product sweet spot still remains, and they, in some cases, will pull us into the cloud. In other cases, we have to go talk to someone that's entirely different, for, and again, that's more of an administrative view. But to your point, going up the stack now, if you go to the, not even vice president of infrastructure, you go to the CIO, he or she says, you know, I, I am tired of thinking about boxes. I'm tired of thinking about where this resides. I want to think business outcome. So for us, that's actually a great conversation because it all comes back to data. That's what we're in the business of doing. We capture, protect, and move data. So that brings it back to strategy. We, we, we got to run, but, but summarize in your words, just sort of the, the strategy of Veeam and where you see you know, this whole thing going. Yeah, I, I would simplistically say it's more of the same. We want to continue to offer what we think is a best of breed solution for on-prem and increasingly cloud availability, but also we want to offer real customer value in terms of now being able to leverage that data, get more value out of that, whether that's DevOps, running analytics against that, security test patch, whatever it may be, we want to be able to give you just the data you need, so have granularity, and offer speed and ease of use to do that. So as data becomes more and more important, you're seeing companies go beyond backup, trying to get more out of their, their, their backup, move into data protection, data management, not just an insurance policy anymore. Dave Russell, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It was great to have you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with Peter Burris as my co-host. We're at Veeam On Live from Miami. You're watching theCUBE. Thank you.